librarylibrary.org. Just a reminder that Thridi's book is available for purchase from Hudson's independent bookstore, The Learned Owl. We'll put a link in the chat for purchase information. And as always, questions for the author are welcome and encouraged. At any time during the discussion, type your question into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. It is my privilege to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Umar Gar is the best-selling author of eight novels, including The Space Between Us, which was a finalist for the Penned Beyond Margins Award, as well as a memoir and three picture books. Her books have been translated into several languages and published in more than 15 countries. She's the winner of a Lambda Literary Award and a Seth Rosenberg Award and is Distinguished Professor of English at Case Western Reserve University. A recipient of the Neiman Fellowship to Harvard, she has contributed to the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and Huffington Post. She's joined in tonight, co tonight's conversation with Kabir Bhatia, senior reporter, WKSU IdeaStream Public Media. Thridi and Kabir, thank you so much for being here tonight with us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much uh, for being here uh, on this on this Zoom, everyone. And of course, to our very special guest, Thridi Umregar. Uh, it's an honor to speak with you. I've, of course, you know, being in this area my whole life, uh, heard so much about you, read your books, uh, uh, and your, your reputation uh, precedes you, as they say. Uh -oh. so, yeah, we're very excited to have you here. And I know that you've spoken at the library before. This is probably the first one you've done on Zoom, though, for the Hudson Library. It's true. It's true. Yeah. And Kabir, thank you. Uh, this this event was, uh, you know, we just planned it a few weeks ago. And I'm so thankful to you for saying yes to doing this with me today. So thank you for that. So, oh, happy to. It's it's, it's an honor. And uh, be, before we get to your, your current book, I have to say, and I was going to hold it up, uh, uh, Bindi's Diwali, which came out two years ago. Right. Uh, every We have four kids and all of them are fascinated by it. They love it. They say, it's someone who looks like me. It's our holiday. And so um, that's a book I think that people should definitely check out if they, when, when you go to the Hudson Library Children's Area, that book, which came out in 2020. Right. Well, that, that does my heart a lot of good to know that actual children are reading the, a book that I wrote. That, that means a lot. So please say hi to your kids from me. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, and, and this new book, uh, Honor, I, I think as I was looking uh, uh, over the, the materials and everything, when I first got this assignment and I knew you were going to be speaking with us, uh, I, I looked over and I said, this is, uh, this is something, I mean, it takes place in India, of course, um, but there are parallels here happening, I think, to, to things happening outside of India, shall we say. So maybe to begin, if you want, without obviously giving too much of the book away, uh, to give people a little taster of, of what the book is like. Sure. Um, and thank you for sort of drawing that connection between, you know, what happens in one corner of the world and then, of course, what appears to be universal and global trends. Um, I, I always appreciate it when readers make those kinds of connections. Um, so Honor, in a nutshell, basically tells two parallel stories that eventually intersect at some point. And the two major characters, they're both female characters. One is Mina, who is, um, she's this poor, um, you know, village woman, uh, daughter of peasants, functionally illiterate very marginalized, um, who, um, and she's a young woman, um, and she has sort of always lived under the control of not just her older brothers, but also sort of the village elders, you know? It's a pretty patriarchal, traditional society. Um, but Mina takes two steps towards sort of finding her own way and her own voice. The first is she accepts a job in a factory outside her home and incurs the wrath uh, of her brothers as a result of that. Uh, and then she sort of doubles down, if you will, on that by actually falling in love with a coworker who happens to be Muslim. And that is a true no-no and she marries him. And because of that, she pays a very, very high price. Um, Smita is an Indian American journalist. She's a, a correspondent for a newspaper in New York. And she sort of parachutes into India uh, to cover Mina's story. Um, and we sense very early on that Smita is not at all thrilled, even though she was born in Bombay, India, 
lived there till she was a teenager when her whole family um, moved to the US. We just sense that something about being back in India makes her very uneasy. And as the novel unfolds, we get to know a little bit about Smita's background and her story. Um, so I guess that in a nutshell is what the book is about. And then it's also about, of course, the connections that the two women form by telling, you know, by, by Smita hearing Mina's story and, and the kind of feelings and the kind of rethinking and recalibration, if you will, that that elicits in, in Smita. And when you were growing up in India, the part of it, you, you were in what is now Mumbai, Bombay then, uh, it was, a, you know, that city is, it's an international city, very uh, progressive, maybe for lack of a better term, uh, uh, modernized cosmopolitan, maybe compared to some of India. So how, how difficult was it for you to get into the mind of uh, really of Mina um, in, in this book. And then as well for Smita, because you've been gone for a lot longer than Smita has been gone. Has, but yeah, very, very true. Great questions. Uh, so I think you've answered your own question in part, clearly getting into Mina's head was a challenge for me. You know, I, I had very little experience uh, with village life in India as a lot of urban uh, Bombayites would. Um, uh, you know, I hadn't really spent any significant time in the villages. So a lot of that was just research, you know, just good old fashioned research. You know, what do the villages look like? How are the houses, you know, are they in clusters? Are they spread out? You know, all that I just had to learn. Um, uh, but harder than that, of course, was finding Mina's voice because Mina talks to us in the novel directly in the first person. And that always raises the bar. You know, when you're writing in the third person, you have a little bit more wiggle room, you know, when you're, you know, when you want to sound like a person would actually sound like in real life, it's a bit harder. It's a bit of a challenge. Uh, so I did, I spent a lot of time on those, even though Mina's chapters are really much shorter and they are less a part of the book than Smita's. Um, I, that was where sort of the craft of writing uh, really came into play because even though I wanted Mina's voice to have that kind of innocence, that kind of lack of worldliness, which is who she is as a character, I for not for a second did I want her to sound ignorant or stupid or dumb because she's none of those things. You know, she's a very enterprising young woman in her own right. And in fact, I wanted to sort of raise the bar for myself and even give her a kind of musicality in her speech, you know, the, the kind of music, the kind of musicality that everyday people often have, you know, just in their language and the way they speak, the idioms that they use, that kind of stuff. So, you know, it was trying to knit all of that into a sentence. And, and so that was, that was really the challenge. And, and Smita, yeah, you know, also, other than the fact that I've been away far longer than Smita had, um, the other challenge is, you know, when I left India, I left to come for the happiest of reasons. I came to go to grad school in the United States. I wasn't running away from anything back home, right? Smita, as I've mentioned earlier, is, she has some secrets. She has a shadow uh, that's following her. And um, that was more of the challenge, you know? On one hand, in a very superficial and obvious way, Smita and I have a lot in common. We are both urban people. Um, we both are, I was a former journalist. She is still a journalist, you know, so I, there was a lot that we had in common, um, but I didn't suffer any kind of trauma in India the way she does. So she called for a different kind of delicacy, uh, if you will, in terms of handling her. And she's uh, at least, uh, I guess, a generation removed from you. The India she's, looking back on is, is one that, you know, came well after uh, you were gone. How did you, you must visit India frequently enough to have known what India was like in 1998 versus today versus 1980. Yeah, very much so. And, and the most, you know, there are the obvious differences. Well, I'll tell you, there are two very sort of visual, if you will, differences between, so I grew up, you know, really I came of age in Bombay in the 1970s, you know, Smita comes a good 20 years after, you know, I did. Um, so visually the city 
is completely altered, right? All the old buildings are being torn down. You know, the six story, seven story buildings are down and you have the 34, 25 uh, story buildings going up, just these thin stalks of skyscrapers all over the city. So visually it looks very different than the city that I remember. Um, there is also, I have noticed in the last 15, 20 years, uh, even amongst my middle-class relatives, there's a kind of new, you know, since I'm talking about post-globalization, there's a kind of confidence now about being Indian, about, you know, why, why on earth would I think of going to the West? You know, why, you know, we have a higher standard of living in some ways than you people do. That's very different um, than my generation of Indians, you know, who, who really came here uh, many, in many cases for educational opportunities, for economic opportunities, all that is different now. I have noticed that those are the kinds of observations I've made on my trips back. Um, but, you know, there are still aspects uh, of the city that remain the same. There's a kind of friendliness and sweetness on the streets that still draws me that I find extremely enduring. There's this willingness to help strangers that is lovely, you know, to watch. Those things have endured. The one thing that troubles me, and in part is the reason I wrote this book, is that there definitely seems to be a movement towards fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism, um, that at least for one brief shiny moment, you know, in the city that I grew up in, um, maybe I was just too young and perhaps even too privileged to have really experienced that. Um, but it did feel like, you know, India, as you know, was founded uh, as a secular democracy. And at least while I was growing up and until quite recently, nobody questioned that. You know, that was always a point of pride, I think, amongst most citizens, you know. Um, these days, there are voices who say the very founding of independent India was a mistake. It should have been a Hindu state uh, all along, right? That kind of questioning, that kind of a backlash to what has mostly been a kind of happy mix of different religions, different people, um, that is sobering. Um, and of course, as you pointed out so rightly, this is something that we are seeing, not just in India, but throughout the world. So that was going to be my next question. If, if, my, if my math is correct and the amount of time it takes to to really uh, uh, write a, a book. You must have been writing this over say the past four or five years during the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of changes here in the United States and things. So how much did what was going on here inform this story that you happen to have set in India? Yeah, uh, it's another very good question. You know, it wasn't so much the coronavirus in some way and the quarantine that followed for somebody like me, I suspect this is true for many writers, it, it didn't change our lives all that much. I mean, you know, writing is a solitary pursuit anyway. Uh, so that part of it was, and you know, I think I'd finished the novel before the true backlash and sort of ugliness that we are seeing now had really taken root. But I most certainly wrote it in the early years of the Trump administration. And, and that of course weighed very heavily on my mind. And, and you know, I was appalled, I mean, I, when I first came to this country as this very starry-eyed, dreamy, 21-year-old grad student, um, I just always hoped in those days that India would become uh, more like the US, you know, in terms of freedoms and democracy and robust conversation and dialogues and, and always this attempt to better yourself, better yourself. You know, we'd had the civil rights movement, we had had the gay rights movement, we'd had the feminist movement. It seemed like progress was in our DNA. You know, nobody in those days was really thinking about slipping back in history, slipping back in time. And to my great, great dismay, you know, what it feels more like is that the trends are going in the opposite direction than, than what I had hoped for. So that is a very humbling and sobering reality that I think not just immigrants like myself, but, but many, many Americans have come to understand that there is nothing guaranteed about progress, you know, that progress can slide back uh, in the blink of an eye if we're not paying attention, you know. 
in in the book, do um, Mina's brothers do they kind of represent? I mean, I, I realize that they do represent uh, kind of a, a an older way of thinking. I don't want to say traditional, but a way of thinking whose time we've hopefully progressed from. I, I assume they're supposed to be representing that, but also that they feel that this is this is just normal. This is what we do. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be any problem with this in, in their mind. Yeah, uh, you, you know, you know, uh, I don't think this is a line. I'm writing another book right now, so I'm already getting a little confused between what I'm writing for the book that I'm writing and what's in honor. Sorry, forgive me for that. But, um, you know, I, I really believe this, that nobody is the villain of their own story. That's just not how human beings are wired, you know. Um, most of us, when we do things that other people might consider to be appalling and inexcusable, we can always find reasons and ways to justify them. You know, that's one of the sad things, I think, about being human. Um, and so you're absolutely right. I think um, Govind and Arvind, her brothers, they, they would be bewildered if somebody thought that they were doing the dishonorable thing. I mean, hence the title, because it, the word honor, you know, there's no single meaning to it. Different people have different interpretations of it. And they certainly think that she has dishonored the family by these, by breaking all these taboos, right? All these rules, these customs that the village has had for hundreds of years. And of course, if something has survived for hundreds of years, there has to be some good reason for its survival, even though nobody might even remember uh, the reasons for the survival. So, so when somebody strays from that path that has been, you know, set by your ancestors, I mean, this is that traditional way of thinking. Um, of course, they need to be punished for it, because if they don't, and, you know, of course, in all these patriarchal, very conservative societies, again, regardless of nationality, all these things always, always seem to be attempts to control women's bodies. I mean, if you really parse what the word honor and reputation and what will, you know, the neighbors say, if you really parse all that, nine times out of 10, it is linked to women's sexuality. And who gets to control that, right? Does the woman have any authority and agency of her own? Or is it some outside force, you know? Um, and yeah, so, you know, there's a lot to tease out there, I think, Kabir. So I, I'm, I don't want to give too much of the book away, so I'm, I'm not going to pursue that uh, uh, further at the, at the moment. But uh, you did mention, by the way, that you're you're already working on your next book. Anything that you can tell us? Any preview? Uh, a title? I know you love to give out titles that get changed later. So. Yeah, I won't give you the title because okay. I think it happens to be a great title. Um, okay. Probably okay. my best title ever. So I want to hold on to that because who knows when the book will see light of day, if it does ever. And I don't want to have anybody else borrow that title from me. Um, I'm sort of being facetious here. But on the other hand, I'm not going to give you the title. But the book is, um, it is also a book in some ways about going home. But it's a very, very different kind of going home. It's a much, it's a much more intimate novel. It's a domestic novel. And it's about this young man who has been in America for a long time, successful, married to an American wife. Um, who goes home for certain reasons. And um, we find out that he's all, his mother still lives in India. Uh, she is recently widowed. She's been a widow for about three years. And he has always had a very pro problematic relationship with his mom. And while he's there, events happen that reveal a family secret that has to make him not just sort of uh, rethink his relationship with his mother, but who he is, who he is, what he stands for, um, all those things. So it's it's a very different novel than Honor, which is nice because I don't think I could tell the same story twice, you know. Of course, of course. Uh, we have a couple questions here and I'm going to throw one that, that's not on here, but that I've wondered about. And I think other people have. Uh, your, your books, so many of them just sound so cinematic. This is the one you just described, the one that we're talking about now, Honor. Uh, has, has there ever been any discussion, anything about possibly making yeah. these films? 
many, many, many times. There have been more uh, film options than I can count, but every single time, you know, the first time there was one for a novel called The Space Between Us, it totally coincided with the Screenwriters Guild strike in Hollywood. Yeah, the next time I think was the recession. It's like, it's just been, I mean, it's it's like a running joke in the publishing industry. Like a lot of books do get optioned, but it's like, you know, the proverb about many a slip between the cup and the lip, right? And that has always happened. However, I think there is some serious interest right now in a couple of back titles. Um, you know, we'll see. I mean, I'm always hopeful. I would just love to be part of that experience, frankly, more than anything else, you know, because film is such a different medium. And in some ways, it's a more freeing uh, medium, you know. So, so fingers crossed. And if anybody in the audience, you know, wants to take around a hat collection and raise the funds, yeah, sure, go for it. <laughs> That would be great. Just, just curious, something that, that uh, I've always wondered about. Um, this question here that we've gotten, it's from someone named Barb, who is, I believe, still on the Zoom and said they finished the book last week. They said it was fabulous. Uh, they were recommending it. They agreed that Mina spoke musically and they love the character developments. Uh, there's two questions here. Uh, one is how aware of the small communities and discrimination that's presented in the book were you aware of before you wrote this book? Um. I think I was fairly aware of it. Um, I mean, I, you know, I read, I read newspapers, I read magazines. Um, you know, I, uh, when I go back to India, I'm always hearing stories, not from my relatives who happen to be of the more or less of the same social class that I was raised in, but, you know, uh, the poor who maybe sometimes work in their homes. I'm, always, always interested, uh, not just when I travel to India, but when I travel anywhere. I, I never want to be a tourist in a place, you know, I always want to hear people's lived experience and how they live on a day to day. So sometimes you hear these stories that just make your hair stand up. Uh, however, I also got very, very lucky because um, I don't know that honor would have existed if I hadn't come across a bunch of articles in the New York Times uh, written by this really wonderful writer by the name of Ellen Berry. And Ellen Berry was based in South Asia at that time. And she did a bunch of really great stories about on different aspects of small town and village life in India. And some of them are very eye-opening. The first thing that I mentioned about Mina and her younger sister seeking employment outside the home, that was heavily influenced by a story that Ellen Berry did about precisely that, some very obscure village somewhere in India uh, where the women decide to go to work and the backlash that, that follows. So, um, so, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm interested in these kinds of issues just as a human being. Um, so, so I do pay attention to them. And yet some of the details of the kind of punishment, you know, the the women in the real life women in, in the journalistic pieces that I'm referring to being ostracized by the whole village. That is something I couldn't have known, you know? Um, so it's always a combination of what you hear, what you read, that kind of thing. Have you, by the way, for, for this book received uh, any, I mean, and if you don't want to, of course, discuss this, you, you wouldn't have to, uh, from, from any folks who are either Hindu or Muslim who have read this book and, and been uh, unhappy with it in some way? Have you heard from folks with that? Yes. Okay. That's all you're going to say on that, I, I'm assuming. <laughs> That's so. fine. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, you had written um, the, is it the Story Hour, and it was an African-American character, and that was pretty well yeah. received, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah see? Yeah. So there's something for everyone there. Exactly. Uh, and, and, you know, people have every right to hate a book. You know, and they have every right to write to the author and, and tell her that, you know, that's that's legit. Of course, of course. Uh, the second part of her question was, and I think you and I could both answer this, but I'm going to let you do it since you're, you're, since you're here with us. Uh, the term auntie was used many times for non-relatives in the book. And this person was wondering if you could elaborate on, on how that works. You, you take that one. You want me? Okay. Well, we... I'll take a sip of water. Okay, if I met Triti Umbregar like at my parents' house or at a party, that's what I would be calling her. So it's almost like uh, Ms., Mrs., it's, it's almost of that. 
anyone that you are are speaking with out of respect, that's what you would you would be yeah. saying. And if Kabir called me auntie at his parents' house, I would smack him on the head and say, "Call me by my first name." <laughs> <laughs> we can do that too. That's fine. Yeah, uh, no, it's 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 a sign of respect, and usually for somebody who is older, right? It's a sign yeah. of respect for an elder. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and then the flip side of that is in Hindi, there are so many intricate, specialized names for father's younger sister, father's yeah. older, which we won't even get into right now. Right, right. <laughs> um, the next question that's come in is from Chris. And uh, Chris wanted to know, how do the topics and characters come to you in order to write a novel? Yeah, so I'll just talk about honor because every every single book has a different origin point, obviously. You know, sometimes a novel... Uh, will come to you with an opening line. And you may just not know much about what that opening line means. Um, uh, sometimes it's just an idea. Uh, sometimes the whole novel, like just when I wrote this book called Everybody's Son a few years ago, I mean, I knew the whole novel in the span of 15 to 30 seconds. Just, and, and the whole plot of the novel came to me with the names of the characters attached. That has never happened before and probably will never happen again, you know. Um, but but for this novel, I mean, I, I think this novel very much started with the character of Mina. And the character of Mina, as I've mentioned earlier, was very much influenced by these articles uh, in the Times that I had read. I just thought, you know, one of those um, brave, courageous women who defied authority that I read about in Ellen Berry's work uh, would be somebody like Mina. And then the fact that she would fall in love with a Muslim man and all, I think just sort of, you know, it's like coins in a slot machine, it just sort of falls in place. Um, Smita's character had a slightly different origin point and it's more convoluted. It's not nearly as direct as the Mina character. Um, so again, I'm also trying to be coy and not do too many spoilers, but um, there was a historical event in the history of Bombay, uh, which came to be known as the Bombay riots, which were religious riots between Hindus and Muslims. And I was out of India by that time, but I still had family in India at that time. And my father had told me um, uh, about something that he did to help a Muslim neighbor. And um, he wasn't, you know, he was just, we were talking on the phone and he was just telling me, yeah, this happened, this happened. And uh, he, he told me something that he did as a way of helping them that really struck me. He said it in the most matter of fact way, but to me, it felt like, oh my God, this is the essence of being an honorable person to not just not take advantage of somebody at a time like this when, you know, they were fearful for their very lives, but, but to help them, but to help them with, in a very classy kind of a way, which is what he had done. And, um, and you know, so my response from 10,000 miles away to those riots was twofold. One was in a, I was grieving in a kind of uh, larger political sense, you know, I, my city was gone. I mean, the city that I had grown up in, you know, bohemian, as you said, cosmopolitan, Western, um, you know, somehow above all this um, was gone. Um, you know, it, it was like any other part of India now, you know, that's what it felt like. And there was a real sense of loss uh, in that. But then there was also this strange kind of pride at how heroically and decently, um, you know, individuals like my father had acted during that time. Um, and all that just stayed with me. I, I never expected to turn that into anything. It was just just these feelings, you know? Um, and then when, when I was writing the other half of the novel, I kind of drew upon my own individual response to some of that, which is a very, very long, long-winded answer to an excellent question, but there it is. That's what we wanted to hear though. So that's, that, that, was, that was helpful. And those riots were almost 30 years ago. Those, I think we're talking about the same. Yeah, uh, early 90s, yeah. Yeah, so for something to stay with you that long and then make it into, uh, into, a, into a book, is, is, it must have, I mean, not just because it's your father, but just the story that something like that happened. Does that happen to you often that you reach back into your memory and there's something that so affected you 30, 40 years yeah. ago? That yeah, and sometimes, sometimes it doesn't even have to be anything personal. I, I remember when I wrote my very first novel, Bombay Time, 
I had this character who was like this, she's like an older lady. She's like the neighborhood gossip. She's this very crabby, crotchety character, you know, who, but everybody in the community uh, turns to her for advice, you know, about uh, errant children or, or bad marriages. And inevitably she gives them awful advice. You know, she's never trying to bring people together, you know, and I had her and I loved her as a character, but I thought, who is she? You know, why, why, why does she act like this? You know, why is she so mean? And I remembered a story from several years ago that somebody that I knew who was m much older than I was at that time had told me about growing up in a very different India at that time, where it was still unusual in her generation. I mean, this woman was at least a generation and a half removed from me. Um, and it was uh, not very common for women to, you know, become doctors or get PhDs or, you know, so this must have been, I don't know, in the 50s, 40s, 50s, somewhere there. Um, and um, she had had something that had happened to her older sister, where the older sister who was brilliant and had all this potential was married off to her father's best friend's son, right? And, and was rightfully bitter about that. And the, the good news was, the father was so filled with remorse at what he had done that he promised the other three sisters that they would be free to, you know, travel and, and educate themselves and rise as high as they chose to. And indeed he kept his, you know, all the other, like my friend was extremely accomplished, you know. Um, but I had just heard that as a story, right? Never ever thought, this was way before I ever became a novelist. And then when I was thinking of a backstory for Dosa, you know, this story just came back to me and I thought, of course, this is why she's such a bitter person because her own potential was squashed off so early in life, you know? So, you know, you, you beg, you borrow, you steal, hopefully you don't plagiarize, but you know, you just, you just use life uh, to, to tell stories, you know? And this kind of uh, uh, follows from that. This next question is from someone, uh, Cindy, who's on here. Uh, what motivated you to include the lovely boy meets girl love story in this? It feels like a departure. Um, it felt organic uh, to the novel. In fact, I'll confess that an earlier draft of the novel uh, was much more when I, when I first imagined the novel, I really thought it was only going to be a novel about Smita and Mina and their relationship, their friendship. Um, Mohan like muscled his way into this novel. I don't think I've ever had a character do that before um, because I had written several, several, several chapters with just Smita making her way into India when he just like popped up one day. I, I remember the exact moment I somewhere I, still have those pages. I hand wrote his first scene into the novel. I was on an Amtrak between Boston to New York on the silent car and was just, you know, I just thought I'm nothing. I'm bored. You know, I can't talk to anybody. I'll just write, you know, and there he was, you know, and once Mohan was there on the page, um, I kind of fell in love with him. So, so I had to introduce him to Smita. And uh, so it felt very organic the way it did. And though I have to say in retrospect, it is, it is a, it's a hard novel. Uh, it was a hard novel to write, emotionally speaking. It's a hard novel, I think, to read for some people. And um, it, needed, it needed some love, it needed some hope in it for it to work. So I think what felt organic and instinctive and almost out of my control ended up helping. It's a, a happy accident, as they say. Maybe not yeah. accident, but yeah. No, that, that's right. Yeah. It finally uh, showed up. I, I did want to say you were mentioning the, the um, you know, the way India was when you were growing up. And in the book, there's sort of this, this dichotomy between uh, Smita, who, who certainly looks Indian because she, she was born there, uh, but her, her, her level of confidence and her personality immediately tip people off that she has has not been there for very long, has right. not been back in India. She's she's from elsewhere. Is that something that you encounter as well when you're there, or or can or, or are people in the dark still? 
No, I think that very much happens. And, and the most sort of mind blowing thing that happens is, um, you know, I don't know, I don't know if you've ever been to India even or, okay. Um, so, you know, we still have street urchins, at least in the cities. And a lot of them are just little kids, right? Begging for money. And, and so the thing that blows my mind is I can be with a friend who I grew up with in India and still lives there, has never left. And, you know, we're dressed in the same way. We both have short hair. We both wear jeans and sneakers and, you know, a shirt or a t-shirt or a blouse or whatever. And the street urchins will swarm to me and not to her because they recognize, I mean, we're talking about kids as young as three and four years old, right? They recognize a difference somehow, right? And I, I'm not even speaking, so you can't say, oh, it's an accent that they uh, pick up on. No, it's just a demeanor, you know? And it's, it, I, I just, I can't get my mind around that, frankly, you know? I don't know. I think you're right. When I was little, my grandmother said for my brother and I that uh, it was the way we walked, which I didn't understand then or now, really. <laughs> I remember the very first time I went back to India after being in the U.S. for like a year, just a year, everybody in the family started giggling. And I was like, what? What? You know, and they said, why are you talking so loudly? And I said, I'm talking loudly. And they were like, yeah, you just sound totally different. And you look like you've grown. I'm like, yeah, I've grown this way. But how can I mean, I'm 21 years old. You know, you're not supposed to. They said, no, you look taller. Who knew? Who knew? Yeah. These things yeah. happen here, I suppose. It's, Yay, it's the, Big Macs, you know? Yeah, right. It's the gravity, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have a question from Mary. From what you've learned about the police and legal systems in India today, are they as corrupt as you have depicted them? And maybe I would add to that or compared to when you left India, how they were. Yeah, I, I don't know uh, if I'm in any position to do that kind of historical comparison, because again, you know, I, I grew up pretty sheltered. I had no encounters of my own with the uh, judicial or, you know, but um, yeah, I do think there's, there's a lot of corruption. Um, I, I'm, there is some corruption in the judiciary. I mean, certainly when it comes to civil trials, I've heard that firsthand from, you know, people who've had uh, cases over apartments and stuff like that. There's corruption and bribery and all that. Um, but in the police ranks, it was, it was just commonplace um, that, you know, you wanted to get out of a traffic um, offense, you know, you slipped. And, and, you know, in a way you have to sympathize with these police officers in these low ranks because their, their pay is so low that if they don't supplement their income, it's just a system that works on this kind of graft and bribery and stuff like that. But of course, as in the case of the novel, it can have really sinister consequences when, when you, know, you combine it with political domination and, and the corruption of the judiciary and stuff like that. Um, Having said all this, um, please, one thing that I feel like I have to say is that I am writing a novel set in a country that has over a billion people in it. And it's, it's one of, probably one of the most complicated, complex, diverse nations on earth, you know? So this is a story that I'm telling, it's a singular story. Um, I'm not making up anything. Everything that I write about in the novel, you can find a corresponding, you know, incident or anecdote in reality. So, but having said that, I am telling a story about six or seven or nine specific people, specific characters. So, you know, extrapolate a little bit, but, but don't extrapolate to a point where you think this is the only reality. Um, it, that would be as foolish as trying to reduce the United States to any one thing. We can't, you know. Yeah, absolutely. There, there, there's many different uh, uh, apples, some good, some bad in every profession in every right. country. Right. So right. this is not meant as an attack. Uh, right. Talk a little bit about the cover, because I was reading something where you were discussing the cover and how initially you weren't sure if this was the right cover for the book Honor. Yeah, when they first showed it to me, I have to say, I just, I just didn't know, you know, because I mean, mangoes, India, it's such a 
it's a trope in some ways, and perhaps even a stereotype in some ways, you know? So my, my very first reaction is, uh oh, you know, I, I don't know, you know? Um, but I talked it over actually with a few writer friends, you know, South Asian uh, writer friends, and they just said, Thridi, it's a beautiful, beautiful cover. It's very artistic. And, you know, you would be foolish to, to raise a stink about this, you know, not that I would have, but, you know, and I did have a conversation with my editor, I believe, and, and sort of asked her opinion about it or why. And, and, you know, she pointed out, I had sort of almost forgotten this very small, but very um, pivotal scene where Abdul, um, the man that Mina ends up marrying, you know, when he's first sort of doing this very tentative courtship of her, because, you know, there's that religious taboo that they are both about to break. Um, he woos her. The very first gift that he gives her is like two mangoes, you know, because that's all he can afford. And, um, and, and to my editor, that felt like such a meaningful and sweet and important uh, scene in the novel that um, she understood why this was the jacket. And I have to say, um, I mean, although I can take zero credit uh, for the jacket, I've grown to love it very much also. It is, it's very striking, that's true. Yeah. So everyone, everyone should look for it at the Learned Owl or the Hudson Library or Max oh, Max, yeah. wherever, and yeah, you must have, there you I go. Have right yeah. I have the ebook, so I can't hold it up, but, but yeah. everyone now everyone can see what we're talking about. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, I was uh, wondering about after, after you know, the, the cliche question is, what do you want people to take away from this book? Uh, is the message of this book that, you know, look at whether you're in the U.S. or in India, look at what's happening around you and, and where we might be headed? Or is there a different message you're, you're hoping to get out there as far as, you know, maybe uh, opening your mind when it comes to the person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with or, or hope to spend the rest of your life with. What is it? Is it both? Is it more than that? Or what's the primary thing you're hoping people take I, away? I don't even know if I am. I don't know if I have any um, desire or, you know, I don't know if there's a takeaway uh, in, in the book in that way. I think the book is an exploration of different ways to define honor I think each of us as individuals has to come down on one side or the other of how, what we think being honorable in this world actually means, how we should conduct ourselves in the larger world. Um, I, think, I think that is all that I'm really trying to say, you know, that, that maybe some of these notions that we have thought of in the past as being honorable need to be relitigated. Maybe they need to be rethought um, and, and, you know, is there a better way of, of being in the world, you know, so. Speaking of people in the world, we have a question from Carol. Do Muslims and Hindus live in the same neighborhoods in India or are they separate? And uh, I think I, I, I mentioned this before. And if, if you want to do this again, maybe if you want to compare and contrast how it is in, say, Mumbai to the villages that you're writing about in this book. Yeah. Yeah, so clearly there's a big, just like there is in this country, there's a big uh, divide between rural India and urban air India. Uh, obviously in the cities, you know, it's much more of a melting pot. Um, you know, people pour into big cities like Delhi and Calcutta and Madras and um, um, Bombay, and I'm using all the old names for it, I realize that. Um, in, in literally, I mean, hundreds upon hundreds of families pour from the villages into the cities almost on a daily basis. Uh, so it would be very difficult to have that kind of religious segregation, if you will, in the cities. Um, many of the villages are also very mixed. I mean, one of the marvelous things about Indian culture, uh, fundamentally, is that for centuries, it's been a very absorbent culture. I mean, this is, if, if you are any kind of a historian, this is what any historian will tell you, that, that one of the glories, which is what makes the current reality so painful, one of the glories of Indian culture is how, you know, whether it was a conquest from uh, Muslim rulers who ruled India for hundreds of years, any outside influence, uh, there, was, there was something in that culture that absorbed all those uh, influences and made it Indianized in some way. Um, so clearly you have many instances of 
Hindus and neighbors who are uh, Hindus and Muslims who have lived side by side as neighbors for sometimes for hundreds of years, you know, um, a lot of this is is because of a kind of political manipulation that happens in this country that pits people against one another. You know, anytime somebody decides that instead of working to earn somebody's vote, an easier shorthand is to just pit people against one another you get the kind of tragedies that we are talking about. Good point. I, I won't touch that any further because I don't want to get in any trouble. <laughs> so, but, uh, and I, I will say that uh, we're, we're going to wrap up here in a moment. We've gotten a couple of questions that I think are going to give away key plot points for the, uh, for the book So I, and some spoilers. So I, if I've skipped your question, that's, there's probably a reason for that. I, I apologize, but we, don't, we want everyone to go out and check the book out for yourselves as opposed to uh, uh, giving it away here. And, and if you really want, you can absolutely write to me via email and I'll be happy to, any questions that we don't get to here, I'll be thrilled to answer them for you. And I think Polly mentioned at the beginning, but for anyone who didn't catch that or, or who, who wasn't aware, uh, she lives right here in Northeast Ohio and has uh, been a professor at Case for many years. So uh, even though uh, Sviti Umargar is from India, she's also from Cleveland. She's one of our own, as they say. Uh, well, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. We all do. We're so honored to have you uh, speaking with us. Any, any last words that you'd like to share with uh, the audience? We have about 100 people here. No, I just want to thank everyone for taking time off on a Thursday evening to um, to attend. I'm very happy. And please, if you do have any questions, um, by all means, just email me. You can get my email address from my website, which is umregar.com. And um, I'll be I'll be delighted to be in a correspondence with you. And once again, Kabir, I have to thank you for doing this for me. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Hudson and, and uh, uh, speaking with me and uh, everyone. Oh, now we're getting these aren't questions. Everyone's saying thank you so much for a wonderful talk. No spoilers. I'm 180 pages in. You're del you are as delightful as your characters are colorful. So <laughs> you have a lot of fans here on uh, on the Zoom questions. So uh, I will turn it back over to Polly from the library uh, to close things up. I just want to thank um, Kabir for moderating for us. And um, of course, Thridi, always a pleasure to have you. Um, you. You know, we've had you multiple times. We love having you. People are always so excited. So we'd love to have you back for that next book. <laughs> oh, God, I sure hope so. I mean, Zoom is fantastic, but there's nothing like real life, you know? So, I know. Yeah. Um, and, You'll you know, there. once again, Please um, check out 3D's book at The Learned Owl. There's a link in the chat. Um, if you've read it, oh, it's just amazing. And um, if you haven't, check it out. And thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Good night. Bye.